Hello, everybody, and welcome to Canines Talking Sense. This is episode 80, and for this episode, I wanted to do something different. So we're not exactly in my typical studio. We're still in Las Vegas, still in Scent City, but we're over at my friend's studio, John Simons. And on this episode, episode 80, which is the end of year four of the Canines Talking Sense podcast... I wanted to bring on somebody who you guys kind of know, but I feel deserves even more attention, and I know she loves that, but I wanted you guys to all get to know my manager and the person who really holds Ford Canine together, Natalie Morris. Natalie, welcome to Canine's Talking Sense. Hi, thank you guys for having me, and hopefully we have a good 80th episode. Well, of course we will. I have you on here, so it should be just fine. So, you know, I guess first what I'll do, since I will give you time to kind of adjust to being on the podcast, <laughs> um, we can kind of just do a year four in review, in a sense. Um, a lot of good episodes this year. Uh, you got to actually be in a few of them, you know, the the ones we did with Michael Ellis. Um amazing guests throughout this year. So those of you who haven't caught up on the episodes, um, we did things like the medical alert dogs. We did uh, bed bug dogs. We did uh, spaniels and different breeds, Labradors. There's a lot of great episodes from this year. So if you haven't, take the holidays or take your time, but some great information that's out there with a diverse number of topics in detection uh, for all the listeners to listen to. And also with that, the 2023 was a pretty busy year. Sorry, 2022. I'm, not, I'm already there. <laughs> I'm already in 2023. Um, so, but 2022 was a pretty busy year even for you. It was a very busy year. <laughs> we had a lot going on, still doing our dog sales and getting dogs ready as well as starting our Zoom our Zoom stuff when we did our membership. Um, so yeah, it was definitely a busy year and then starting to transition now kind of out of the dog sales side yeah. and getting you know all the stuff prepared for that. We um, did our last uh, dog sales class. Our last handler class was in September. So those that are listening, one of the things that we did, you know, transitioning to where we are now and for 2023, as many of you have seen, there's been a lot of traveling. If you've been following me on social media and even Natalie, and if you don't, we'll have Natalie's social media in the social, in the uh, show notes later on. Um, but we have went from doing, uh, I would say, in 2020 to 2022, we did dog sales and handler schools and things like that. And then the focus for a lot of you that are listening was to help out and teach more. And we started putting the show on the road because it became a lot easier for us to travel to people than it was for everybody to travel to us. Plus, we kind of wanted to get out of Vegas during the summertime. <laughs> that was another... It's always a bonus not to be trying to train dogs up in the middle of a 110-degree summer. <clears throat> yeah, those are never fun. So with that said, uh, we've now moved into our education side of things, both online and in person. So you got to travel and... I want to share with everybody, because as I've put you out there more, first, the people usually reach out and go, I want Cameron, who's this Natalie person? So which is why I want to share this episode with everybody about you. Um, so tell us a little bit about you. Like, how did you get into dogs? What did you do to get into it? Um, how did this passion start? I think, you know, kind of similar probably to most dog trainers. I was a dog obsessed kid. So we had a couple family dogs, you know, not really trained very much. I remember as a kid, we had a um, Rhodesian Ridgeback and watching my dad walk the dog and they had been trained pretty old school and he would tell the dog, heal, heal. And as a kid, I thought heal meant just like, be good, like just do good stuff because the dog was not healing. Mm -hmm, like, you mm -hmm. know, so that when I was a kid, you know, there wasn't really any formal dog training. It's not like my parents were trainers or involved in that or anything. Um, but I was just a dog obsessed kid. And then I had a, actually it was like a fourth grade elementary teacher, you know, knew I was so into dogs and got me a little clicker training book and mm -hmm. it came with a clicker and I ran home and tried to train my like 12 year old, uh, pepper Corgi who was <laughs> having none of it. And I also didn't know what I was doing. I think I read like half of the book and then just grabbed the clicker, you know, 
<laughs> so, um, but that really started me like when I, you know, my next dog, mm-hmm. I want to do this. I want to train it. I want to, you know, get really involved in this. So when I was 15, then we got kind of my first dog, which my dad was really kind of against getting, a, you know, another dog for a long time. Cause obviously with the older dogs, you know, they did all the care. We were too young to, to be involved in that. And, um, so we kind of, between my mom and myself, we kind of just forced his hand and like, well, we're getting this puppy. So, you mm-hmm. know, you're going to have to deal with it. And uh, brought home Coda, a little, she's like a Papillon mix. She's 15, lives with my parents now. Um, so she was like my first dog and I just went crazy training her, trick, mostly trick training. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so we did all sorts of obedience as well as just silly tricks, a lot of stuff with props. And I would enter her in all sorts of trick competitions around Vegas. You even did videos with her, right? Like, yeah. So I got, I was the little, little YouTuber. I had my flip, my flip camera <laughs> and I would um, do all sorts of trick videos with her and then, uh, you know, just upload it to YouTube. But I also entered quite a few like online, whatever online contests for tricks I could find, I would enter them and, and we did okay. We won some cool stuff. My parents started going like, oh, this dog's kind of paying for itself. Like, mm-hmm. I kind of like this. So they got a little bit more into the dogs, I think, because of that. Um, my mom started a pet sitting business mm-hmm. around that same time, so she got more into dogs. Um, so Coda, that was what, kind of my first dog to really learn on. Um, you know, I made a lot of mistakes with that first dog that I ended up learning from. A little bit of behavioral modification that I had to do with her, but nothing crazy. She was a relatively easy dog. And then I got kind of further pushed into learning about training and more mm-hmm. behavioral. Um, when I got my next dog, which was Tess, who is a, she was like an Aussie, maybe like a backyard bred mini Aussie or something. Mm-hmm. But um, she had a lot of issues and we initially took her on as like a foster. And then um, she just had so many issues, like nobody's gonna adopt this dog. Or like this dog shouldn't go to anybody. This dog's crazy. So she, you know, started out pretty fearful mm-hmm. and then me not knowing anything like, oh, I'm adopting this fearful dog. I'm going to make it feel <laughs> so much better. Um, and not really realizing, you know, when you have a fearful dog like that, that can turn into a lot of other stuff. Sure. So she became really reactive. And um, I wouldn't say she was aggressive per se, but um, kind of a scary level of reactiveness. And she would nip people, no serious bites or anything like that. But that dog forced me, like, you better figure this out. My parents weren't going to pay for a trainer to come in and do all that stuff. So I had to figure it out. So I just started reading. I think one of my first, you know, behavioral books was just um, counter conditioning uh, with uh, Patricia McConnell. Mm-hmm. So I started doing a ton of counter conditioning with her and, you know, learning all these different behavioral methods. And then Around that time, as I started progressing with her and she was making a lot of progress, I started training um, more on a professional level. I, you know, I think I was 18 when I did my first dog training job and um, started doing a lot of, you know, pet clients. And so really the first half of my um, dog career was all behavioral cases as well as just, you know, pet obedience. I did group classes and a lot of puppy classes and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. So I did that for a number of years. Um, But I think also kind of in the same way that a lot of us find ourselves doing detection or service dogs or kind of these more specialized fields, we realize that pet dog training is maybe not quite for us or, you know, I I really give it up to the pet dog trainers like that is a hard job because I could train a dog all day like I could do that, you know, I could do some of the behavioral bot or pet obedience like we can do that in our sleep, but to get compliance from owners Mm -hmm. and really create that level of buy-in that you need for them to see and make progress with their pet dogs that they don't care necessarily about the science. So every once in a while you get a really committed client that is interested in, you know, really learning kind of the full uh, spectrum of their dog's behavior. But for the most part, they just want a dog that's going to do what they want it to do. Well, on that point, you have now seen that in the professional world too. Sure. You know, I mean, I think it kind of leaks over. People just want the dog to do the thing. And not everybody has the drive or the interest in learning the hows and whys of how to get there. Um, But obviously, that's a really important aspect when you're working with dogs. So I got really burnt out with the pet dog training. And also, as kind of a baby trainer, you know, I gave way too much of myself to those (laughs) early clients. You know, I was very much kind of a people pleaser with those early clients. Like, I just want them to be happy. But um, sometimes they, I think, you know, sometimes I think the pet dog people, they kind of need a little bit of a kick in the butt. So you have to be able to also bring that out and kind of, 
you know, give a little bit of that, which at that time I was not going to be skilled to do that. Sure. So I really got burnt out and ended up actually taking um, an office job. I did contract work, um, contract coordination work for a number of years. And then I, I did some behavioral and pet stuff on the side, but not anything to the level that I had been doing before. And that's when I started going, I have to get back into dogs. I want to be doing dogs full time again, but I don't, I cannot do pet dog training. <laughs> how, how did you find your way into detection work? So around the time that I was making a lot of progress with tests on the behavioral side, you know, I was always interested in sports. I dabbled in sports with Coda, like agility and stuff like mm -hmm. that, but we never got super serious with it. Um, but when I had tests and she started making progress, I really wanted something to do with her. So originally, I, I love competition obedience, so I trained her up for that, but I didn't feel super comfortable about things like group stays, mm -hmm. which she was solid. She would hold her positions and stuff, but if a dog came up to us, I didn't want her scarring somebody's dog that <laughs> broke their stay because she was going to, like, launch at it and, mm -hmm. you know, scare it. So um, I found nose work with her, and um, it was fun. You know, I liked it. And she was really good at it, and it really brought out kind of a side of her that I had not been able to see the same way. So mm -hmm. that, you know, having them when you're doing nose work and they're working independently and there's not that level of, you know, the handler help, and they really have to be confident to just go into the environment and work mm -hmm. it. Um, and she just loved it so much. You know, she had a really short little bob tail, and when she was doing nose work, that tail was like straight <laughs> up in the air, you know, as high as it could go. So... Her interest in it and how much she liked it and also was pretty good at it really drove me to um, pursue it more. And I have um, a close friend of mine, Sheree Slater, that mm -hmm. was kind of I always refer to her as like my my training partner. So, you know, I call her your dog mom. She's my dog mom. Yeah. yeah. So um, <laughs> we started getting really into it. And yeah. Sheree is the type of person that like. She's not half in something like it's 110 oh, percent yeah. and we're going to do it the right way at 110 percent. So we got really into it together. And, you know, the way that we originally learned was similar to how a lot of people originally learned nose work. And this was, you know, 10, 11 years ago. So, you know, there wasn't a ton of there. You weren't out here. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of people to learn from. Um, so we just as dog trainers kind of figured stuff out ourselves. So we didn't yes. like we weren't a huge fan of the pairing. So right away we started looking at you know, getting rid of that. Um, and we kind of jumped around methods. You know, we did some um, Ramsey stuff for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we did some Steve White. So we just started looking at anybody that was talking about nose work. Mm -hmm. What can we learn from them and what can we take and kind of tweak? And so, you know, those first couple dogs with us, Sheree had a couple dogs that we learned a lot on Ziva, her German Shepherd. And we would just try stuff with them and see what worked and what was successful. And we were clicker trainers. So, you know, we jumped on marker right away. So we did marker training pretty much from the beginning. Um, but we were still feeding at source forever. Mm -hmm. Like Gus is mm -hmm. actually my first dog that I never did feed at source with, you know, as my main um, and he as, has probably one of the best alerts you've ever had trained. They all world. had pretty solid alerts, yeah. but, you know. Um, you did a lot of proofing with him yeah, behavior-wise. Yeah. yeah, and Gus is just like, compared to my previous dogs, like Gus is the dog that is like, I'm ready to do all the things. Yeah. There was no behavioral stuff to figure out with him. You know, he was, he's the perfect sport dog. But, um, yeah, so, you know, I got really into a test and then working with, you know, Cherie's dogs and us just doing that for a number of years. So I really started, you know, my kind of my initial detection journey, you know, with tests maybe, you know, 10, 11 years ago when I got into that and then, you know, just continued doing it. We were definitely much more training heavy than we were trial heavy. You know, I worked, you know, when I was doing my training jobs, I was always working on weekends, right? Yeah. You're always working with your pet clients on weekends when they're available. So those early years, there was no trialing. You know, mm -hmm. I trained mm -hmm. nose work for a number of years before we even did like our level one, yeah. just because of weekend availability. Um, so we were very training heavy versus trial, you know, trial heavy those early days. And actually even now, I guess, because yeah. <laughs> now I'm busy, um, you know, teaching people with you. But yeah, so that's kind of how I initially got into it. And then just you know, started realizing I really wanted to get back into dogs. What could I do to be back into dogs full time that wasn't pet dog training? And then, you know, coupled with my interest in nose work, like how can I become a detection trainer, which, you know, we get that all the time now, people yeah. that come to us and yeah. want to know that. And I totally relate to those people just kind of being desperate to get your foot in the door because mm -hmm. detection is very much, 
you know, a career that similar to dog training where there's no straight path. There's no like you go do this and this and now yeah. you're a detection handler. Like that's not a thing. Everybody has to kind of figure out their own path to it. Um, for me, I was lucky enough that, you know, I had Cameron Ford randomly <laughs> move to my city. <laughs> Uh, right, I mean, pretty much right at the time I was starting to get really serious about like, you were even how applying, am I going to do this? Yeah, yeah, you were applying to our friend Justin Rigney. You put a request to intern out there. Where else did you do uh, this? Justin was really the first one. And, okay. then, and then when I was kind of realizing, okay, that's not going to work, I started looking at, you know, different handling schools that I could yeah. go to. And oh, I'm going to do this security job for two years in this other state so I can get experience to go do this other job. You know, I had all sorts of ideas of how I was going to break into it. Um, and then that's when you kind of came on the scene. But at that point, I was pretty much like, whatever it takes, I'm going to I'm going to break into it, which is why I wanted to interview you, because your story is relatable. Like you said, there's so many people out there that love working with their dogs. Detection is one of the fields that you can potentially make a living at right. being a handler. Uh, doing this kind of work, especially if you weren't law enforcement or military. Yeah. That was the other one. Um, and that's, it's like you said, it's not an easy path. There's no straight line. Um, it, it's opportunities and kind of what you're sharing with everybody is your determination to keep keep going, keep trying. Yeah. Um, there, there was, I mean, like you said, fate stepped in and I end up moving to town that you lived in. And, you know, I'll share the story, uh, how I found you. So what I didn't notice at first was she had sent me an email. Uh, I was looking for interns. I needed something to start right away. I had just left. Uh, there was a local company here I worked with. COVID hit. They shut down. So I had to start figuring out how to, how to do this on my own. And uh, I had to get licensed in Nevada. So I did all that. And once it was done, I needed people to help. And I didn't have the money at the time to pay anybody. So I was looking for the free volunteer. And what I ended up doing was posting on Facebook, I believe. And you were one of the names who, like you said, we talked a couple of times. And the minute you said you couldn't do weekdays very easily, I just was like, nope, I need people, you know, Monday yeah. through Friday kind of thing. So anyhow, don't see, hear from you. We don't talk at all. And then I'm judging a nose work competition. Um, and I'm watching Handler's work, and I think I made a comment about you, and then I happen to have Cherie sitting next to me as my steward uh, helping me out as the judge, and she goes, oh, well, she applied with you before, <laughs> and you said no. And I was like, okay, well, I, I definitely – and I was – it was – the perfect timing again. I needed somebody, um, and I had a means to pay. And you know, kind of fast forwarding through the details of it, you started working with me. You were doing the two jobs. You're doing your normal Monday through Friday, getting up at three o'clock in the morning, and then going to work until three o'clock in the afternoon, driving home, picking up your dogs, driving another forty five minutes to where I lived, training with me, or just doing grunt work. Honestly, it wasn't mm -hmm. even training at that point. You did yeah. like a little bit here and there, but. Uh, you were cleaning kennels, taking care of dogs, doing this the grunt the grunt stuff, uh, putting in you know time, and after about was it two and a half months, three months? It, yeah, it was like yeah, I was, was begging you to months. start with me. I was like, and I was like starting to really yeah. fall off from the crazy oh, hours at that point that I yeah. was that I was like just staying up, <laughs> just the lack of sleep. <laughs> yes, and, and I can see it on certain days, but. So we, you know, we brought you on. You're full time, and, and it's now we're only a few months away from your two year anniversary uh, working with me. And the the those that are listening and watching, you know, everything requires determination and commitment and the ability to go through all of the difficult part, the not the straight line. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be. You know, lack of, I don't want to use the term paying your dues, but it's kind of what it is. I mean, I think that is a lot of our industry, though. There mm -hmm. is still a certain level of, like, you got to kind of come up through your paces. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's, you know, a big part of the industry to kind of know what it's like to, you know, kind of start from the bottom mm -hmm. and, and work your way up. Even mm -hmm. if you are a somewhat, you know, like I was an experienced trainer, not necessarily in detection, you know, I did nose work. Yeah. Um, but, you know, 
kind of making your way um, into the industry by showing that level of commitment and determination that you really want it and you're hungry for it. Mm -hmm. um, and I definitely was at that time. Oh, for I sure. mean, it, it was definitely lucky for me. You know, I, we can't downplay that aspect of mm -hmm. luck that I that I had just by the fact of you randomly coming here. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, if that hadn't happened, who knows? Who knows where I would be? <laughs> but I would definitely you might be, be in Tennessee. I would definitely be doing <laughs> detection. It was funny Pet even when I. When I applied with Justin, I still was like, my focus was detection, but yeah. I knew he did a little bit of detection. So, but in my, you know, email to him was still very like, I just want to learn detection. And his, <laughs> you know, response back was like, well, it's not just detection. We do pet like, dogs That's here. okay. If I can do like five minutes of detection <laughs> yeah. and then, you know, whatever else, I'm happy with that. And also yeah. at the time, you know, I was learning a lot more about kind of some different methodologies. I was always very heavy with clicker training. I didn't really know any much about using other tools. You know, I think I had started using like a prong collar, but I didn't, I really hadn't kind of dipped my toes or learned much about training any other way. And I was really interested at that time of also kind of learning this other side um, of the industry and, you know, what mm -hmm. other methods were out there and stuff like that. So Justin definitely would have been like, that was a way for me to learn some of that as well. Yeah, it's but. different. You know, and, and let's talk about as a, as you developed as a trainer, you got one of your biggest things or the beginning stages was force-free. You, you know, were engrossed into that world. You wanted to learn how can I train the dog with, you know, basically – Positive reinforcement only. Talk a little bit about positive your journey. Positive reinforcement and negative punishment. There you go. So, yeah. So talk about your your journey, you know, as you learned that side and, you know, just you don't have to go like into detail, but just, you know, the pros and cons, what you went through yeah, as a trainer. I mean, you know, I think it's kind of normal as a trainer that you go, you know, you start with kind of what you're introduced to. So, like I said, I got that clicker training mm -hmm. book. That was it. Mm -hmm. It was it was clicker training. And I really, um, I still believe in all those methods that I use, and I still believe to be a well-rounded trainer, you really need to understand those methods. Um, and I, I do think that there's a big kind of side of the behavioral modification world that we can really benefit from. You know, I did, like, I, you know, Tess went from really a problem dog to my demo dog. I used her with other reactive clients and she was she was an angel. Now mm -hmm. she was special. She had we had a really strong connection. Um, but you know, I definitely attribute a lot of my early behavioral modification stuff that was all force free, um, if you want to use that word. You know, it mm -hmm. was it was all um, kind of letting the dog learn how to control the environment or build good associations, that kind of thing. Um, and that was huge for her. So I'm still really big on on utilizing those yeah. methods. Um, but I think that it's also good as a trainer whether you're for or against different methods to understand fully how they work um, and how they're applied and the perspective of other trainers and not, you know, we're big with detection that, you know, our way is one way, not mm -hmm. necessarily mm -hmm. the only way. Yep. And I think that applies kind of across the board with dog training, that there's a lot of different ways to kind of come at an issue and everybody comes to it with their own perspective. Correct. So I'm very happy for the foundation that I had and how committed I was to those methods initially because it taught me so much and I still use a lot of those things today even sure. within our, you know, within our puppy raising mm -hmm. and within working with our own dogs. Um, but definitely kind of coming around where I wasn't so rigid yeah. that like I can't even hear it, you know, yeah, like yeah. Um, it kind of cracks me up. Some of the trainers that I look up to and we talk to today that are such big influences as far as detection, but just in general go, um, I probably would have argued with them five years ago or sure. 10 years ago that like, oh, you're using a prom caller or something like that. Yeah. And then you kind of, you know, I think there's a level, there's a point in the kind of your training career that you realize like you hit that point where you're like, I don't know anything. Yeah. I really have barely kind of scraped you know, the edge of what is out there and, and what is possible and that, that rigidness just kind of goes away because mm -hmm. you realize there's so much more to learn and to take away from other trainers. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think it's valuable to really look at other perspectives mm -hmm. for whatever kind of avenue you're doing training. Yeah. The uh, – another thing that, you know, you can – I want people to hear from you. What are – the influences, what were the trainers for you that you, let's say, you started off admiring and following and what do you, who do you like to follow and who do you like to learn from today? 
Um, you know, early on, I was definitely a big uh, Patricia McConnell fan. I did a lot of that, so I was a lot of Grisha Stewart stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Sarah Bruschi obviously is a it was a huge one for the you know for the Force Free stuff and like her clicker mechanics are you know it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so you know, those were some of my early day ones. Um, you know, like I said, we did the the Ramsey kind of stuff when we were learning our our detection. Um, Michael Ellis was always, you know, a huge one that, that we followed, yep. um, doing, you know, the, the food mechanics and obviously the, the toy play mechanics and all of that stuff were still huge for us at that time. And I think too, he was probably kind of one of the trainers that you could look at. And when I was so mm-hmm. rigid on that force free side to kind of look at and go, his dogs are really happy and yeah. his dogs look really under, you know, they really understand what's going on. And that kind of starts to, you know, make you shift a little bit as far as that rigidness. Um, so, yeah, I mean, some of my, a lot of my influences, I would say, are, are kind of the same. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely, I've learned kind of more um, trainers that are a huge influence now, like Pat Nolan. Yeah, you know, say, some yeah. of our, you know, some of the ones that we work with specifically in detection. Obviously, when you came on the scene, you know, that was a huge um, kind of shift we could finally feel comfortable to not pay at source <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of laugh with my students like I show I have a lot of video with Tess and some of the earlier stuff and um, I, most of it is the same I'm still using a marker yeah. but I always have to go back and I'm feeding at the dog not necessarily because I thought that that's what you needed but just like that's how we did it so yeah. you no know, thought to kind of change that but um, yeah, it's pretty cool now to be able to actually kind of work with some of those people that have influenced me um, early on and, and also just to, you know, to learn new stuff. Yeah, it's always a journey and you're never you never stop learning. Yeah. You know, it's always something different that you can and we evolve. And that's the biggest thing I always want listeners and, and viewers to understand is we're constantly evolving. I mean, I evolved. I've been doing it now almost 30 years and I have evolved a lot in that time. And I've evolved more in the past 10 years than I did the previous 20. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of me challenging myself that there's, I can do better than what I'm doing. And it's some of the message that I try to share to people in my seminars and people that attend those things is, okay, you're comfortable doing what you're doing. You know that system well. How about this? And whatever that this is, whatever my opportunity is to show them or let them discuss something different, uh, I want to challenge them to get out of that comfort zone and grow. And it's not an easy thing. I think you've seen me do it with the cop world more frequently. Um, I also do the sport world too. The sport world gets plenty of that from me as well. The, the human coaching side of the equation. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes the human coaching comes from you to coach me uh, to how to interact um, because I can get a little passionate about some of the subject matter. Pa- passionate. That's a good That's a, <laughs> yeah, that's good, a good word, word right? Um, but, you know, it is to grow. And yeah. we, we are always going to grow. And it's it's been fun to watch you as a trainer – come on to the scene um, to develop what the skills that you have developed, even in the short period of time I've known you. Um, what What is something that, you know, like you said, you had your detection dog experience in the sport world first. What are some takeaways now that you've been doing it for a couple of years uh, with a good crossover of professionals to sport what have been some of the biggest takeaways you've seen now that you've had this opportunity to see both sides of the detection dog world? Um, you know, it was interesting. I remember coming to your house when I was just interning and I, it was like one of the, maybe like the first week and you had a bunch of cops there and I, I pull up and there's all these canine cop cars and I was like, <laughs> Oh my God, I'm going to get to watch the professionals. This is amazing. And I do think, to a certain level in the sport world, we put our professional handlers up on a pedestal and and not to say that it's not warranted because obviously those dogs and handlers have a very important job and that mm-hmm. should be taken really seriously. Um, but we all have the same problems at the end of the day. A detection, you know, the dogs don't know if they're doing it for sport or if they're doing it for real. They just know that we're asking them to do it. And it is interesting to see that level of crossover as far as 
you, I work with my sport handler that's training a dachshund, and then I go work with my professional handler that's working a lab or a mal or whatever. And there's a lot of times similar issues, mm-hmm. and we, and as handlers, we fall into similar um, kind of ruts or s- similar mistakes. Um, kind of across the board. I think the biggest kind of difference with those two fields is, you know, on the sport side, we deal with much more um, lower arousal dogs that we're trying to create motivation with and really trying to get them to like the game. And then on the professional side, we deal with much more over arousal where we're trying to, okay, I know you're very excited to do this, but we need to think about things a little bit, Um, you know, so and not miss stuff. I definitely, one of the biggest things when I started, and I, I really took it away from that week that I worked with Hank, because um, I hadn't really gotten to work with you a ton, actually, yeah, up, that you know, point, before yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. But um, the pacing was a big thing, you know, and, and on the professional side, we are working more patterns and doing things like that. And, you know, that kind of pacing that um, Hank would kind of like keep up with the dog, you know, mm-hmm. where you're not kind of and I had much slower at that time like I didn't have Gus Tess yeah. was not a fast dog she was good but she wasn't fast mm-hmm. so I was not necessarily used to that kind of pace you know like yeah. wow we're like almost you know fast walking with the dog to work this area um, but that pacing can be really helpful for them versus if we're you know kind of meandering through the area I think you can kind of cause more issues but that was a big takeaway initially was like oh this pacing is really nice Mm -hmm. Um, and I started applying that a lot more and then you know just different things kind of over the years like that uh, you know when you talked about um, that was like kind of a light bulb moment for me for sure when we talked about what is a fringe and then like that you know inaccessible is we're asking the dog you know, in some cases to fringe as well as elevation and the confusion that can come from that as a handler. And then also how you're teaching these concepts to your dog. But that was definitely like a light bulb moment. Like, oh, my God, it is. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, We're okay with it here not okay with it there. But I mean, there was a lot of stuff, I would say, over the years that, you know, it definitely helped me to kind of know where to apply everything since I was coming into it with, you know, a pretty strong nose work background. And I, I was already doing marker you know, so a lot of stuff was already like, this is, yeah, this is how I do think it should be trained, Yeah. you know, and it, and it, and it was, and then to kind of see, you know, hopefully the professional side embracing some of these concepts more, because I will say I am still kind of surprised when we go to some things, the old school methods and just that we haven't evolved a little bit quicker past some of that with the, on the professional side, whereas what you mentioned, the, the sport side does tend to be much kind of quicker to say, ooh, is this going to, this is the new thing that's going to work. I'll jump on that. I'm interested in that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think part of that maybe too comes, you know, when you're doing sport, if your dog doesn't find the birch, it's not that big of a deal. Well, that, and it's when you're in the sport world or even search and rescue is another Mm -hmm. one I categorize it the same. You guys are paying for results. And on the professional side, they get paid to show up to training. Right. Whether training works out or it doesn't work out. It's not the skin in the game is not the same. Right. There's different motivators on both sides. But I think in now doing this and and traveling enough and seeing, you know, people's point of views and and what their goals are, those that pay or put their money into it kind of like, okay, I want results. Now, the catch-22 to that ends up being is chasing the brass ring, like you said earlier, is trying to find – uh, the thing that's working. And before you know it, you've tried four things <laughs> right. and your dog is struggling now because of the confusion. So it's normal. I, I did it, you know, obviously my background is she was the bite work side of the world and did detection too. But, um, you know, as trainers came on the scene, I would follow that trainer's method. And um, my poor dogs, thank God, mm-hmm. dogs are so forgiving yeah, of they us. they really are. And can handle the constant different things we throw at them. Um, so with that, you know, it's it, like the difference basically comes into is how much skin is in the game for you. If you're a handler and you're putting your hard-earned money on there, you kind of want results. Which I the direct result of that is. Things evolve faster in those segments, mm-hmm. um, but the culture is different too. The culture is more open to ideas, where in the professional, let's call it law enforcement, military, 
the culture is, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Right. You know, and there's the peer aspect. You know, you have somebody who's been a dog handler 10 years, 15, 20, whatever it is, and or they have rank and those things kind of dictate how quickly you want to change because for that hand like you said earlier perspective brings in a lot of things so perspective uh from that trainer who's done it for 10 whatever years and they're kind of have a title of some sort either the longest you know serving handler or trainer or whatever it is um they have their things that have worked for them and they've passed that on to those newer teams the newer team's dogs may not perform the same as that trainer's dog. So then there's that frustration of that handler who's like, well, I, I just isn't seem to be working as good as it did for that person's dog, that trainer's dog. Why? I want to try something different. And um, that's, again, in that culture, it's harder to do that because they can, you know, if you rock the boat too much, right. you get pushed out or you're just ostracized and you're on the island by yourself. Um I encourage teams to do that the right way. I've done it the wrong way throughout my career. Um, I did some things the right way, did some things the wrong way, which is why, you know, as you get older, you're wiser at certain things. Um, I still make mistakes. <laughs> I still do um, things that I got like, ah, I should have done it that way. But with all that said, you know, I encourage teams to challenge to a level what they're told, especially if what they're told and what they've been doing doesn't seem to be showing results. Because whether you're paying for those results or you care enough to have a good dog, I I encourage you to seek out to be better. Don't just take the status quo, push yourself to improve, push yourself to be a better handler. And most importantly, what I care about is the dog. You know, that's a lot of where my perspective comes from is what makes that dog's life easier and better? So, you know, again, that that that's where I see a lot of times as we traveled, and I think you've seen some of the same things too, uh, now that you've gone some places, is you're seeing the difference between those that are paid and they get to go there and, you know, um, the results are this and their culture is don't rock the boat versus the ones that you get to work with too that are like, I want results. I want to see this. I make my dog or show me how to perform better with my dog. Sure. So, and the tough part of it too is, you know, I'll bring in a little bit as, you know, seminars, webinars, the access of stuff on, you know, social media and YouTube and things like that also makes sifting through all that information yeah, much absolutely. more difficult. Especially, you know, I mean, I think the kind of nice thing that we have on the sport side is we can t kind of tinker with stuff with ne not really any fallout. If I tinker around with my training and I mess something up, I can just, I'm not going to trial for six months. I'm going to fix this and then I'll trial again. And obviously our professional handlers, they don't have that. They got to go to work tomorrow and the dog yep. has to perform. Yep. So I do understand a level of kind of not wanting to fix stuff that you might not know how to fix. You yep. know, a lot of our handlers are not trainers, so they really are relying on, you know, their their unit trainer or whatever to mm -hmm. help them through mm -hmm. some of this stuff. So it's easy as a trainer to look at it and go, I would change this and this and this, but we know how to fix it if we break it. Yeah. And our handlers don't necessarily always have that, you know, kind of availability of that information. I am always impressed with our professional handlers that – you know, put their own time and money. Yeah, it, like we do get a lot of professional handlers that spend their own personal money to, you know, just get better and learn. And even sometimes just for their, not even just for their dog, maybe their dog mm -hmm. is pretty good, but they just want to learn to make their whole team better. Yeah. And I, you know, I do give it up to those handlers. That's always really awesome to see. Um, you know, I think we just have to kind of hope for a, a slow eventual, you know, kind of cultural shift on some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. That we're more open to, you know, really seeing what works for the dog and what. And makes it's sense. changed a lot too. I mean, it, yeah. it is. We we are seeing some uh -huh. really good shifts for sure. And of course, people like us want it faster, right? <laughs> like anything else, uh, you know, whether you're a dog handler who wants results quickly, or us who, as as an industry, want to see uh, people progress and change faster. It, it's it's normal. We we. The biggest quality of dog trainers that we're supposed to have is patience, but it's the one thing that we <laughs> lack a lot of times. Um, so shifting a little bit from detection, I want to bring in cognition. 
So cognition was new when you were first with me. Like you had seen some stuff, but you really got engrossed into cognition and you are like the main one that goes out now and teaches the cognition classes and seminars and instructor classes for the business. Um, talk about what you, you know, the journey of cognition, what you took away and how it's relatable to not, you know, people label it detection related right now a lot of times because it's us doing it and we're a detection dog business. But again, from your background as a dog trainer, talk about, you know, how things have, you know, what cognition did to you. Yeah, I think, you know, cognition is, a, is an interesting thing to kind of look at as a trainer, even just the testing by itself, because, you know, I think we get very used to kind of doing like what feels right and you're going with your gut and you're, you know, it's it's a very craftful type of, you know, type of thing when you're working with the dog and you're applying a lot of different knowledge to kind of come up with your training plan. And then when you go into your cognitive testing, it's very rigid mm -hmm. and it's very, you know, there's a lot of protocol and you have to, you know, be, really remember that stuff. So I, I know definitely when I was learning it, just that having that kind of rigidness with, with it was like, this is not intuitive necessarily. You know, you really have to kind of make sure you're learning those mechanics, but it was really interesting to start to see it and apply it within our, you know, our dogs that we were working with. You know, it's one thing to watch a group of people do it with their dogs and then, you know, see kind of what their takeaways are. But when you're actually using it and applying it with dogs that you're working every day with and mm -hmm. you can see kind of the different, you know, aspects come out, oh, this dog is really high memory. And then to have that confirmed through through actual testing, mm -hmm. um, the, ar the arousal aspect is probably the number one thing that I take away when we do our cognitive tests on dogs. Like, it's nice to know, obviously, what their, um, you know, what their different inference levels and stuff like that are is. But at the end of the day, you are going to, you're going to kind of work that dog in front of you. So if it needs more sessions, you know, you're going to take that time. And maybe that means it's a little bit lower inference, whatever. But the arousal aspect, you know, when we see that, particularly through our memory with distraction, can be really interesting as far as how that arousal actually affects the dog's ability to um, to remember things mm -hmm. and then also kind of applying it to how the dog is able to learn. Um, and sometimes it's surprising the dogs that are typically in, you know, constantly in high arousal. And you would think like, you know, just as a general high arousal means they're not going to learn well. And some of our dogs learn really well when they're mm -hmm. in high arousal mm -hmm. and that can really shift, you know, how you set up your sessions, but also how you, kind of view that arousal level. So maybe it's not necessarily this huge hindrance that I thought it was, you know, or obviously in other aspects we might go, that arousal is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and obviously for us on the selection side, it's it's nice to be have something that we can really kind of look at as a, as a more structured way of evaluating dogs versus just kind of tinkering with them and saying, oh, I, you know, I like I how like, it plays with the toy. Yeah, exactly. To have something a little more concrete to say, this is how this dog learns. And these are the, the methods that this dog uses. Um, and, and, you know, it's really fun to watch different people uh, throughout all, you know, a lot of our sport handlers are not just detect, you know, they're not just nose work people. Mm -hmm. They're doing obedience and they're doing agility and they're doing all of these other sports. Um, and I think sometimes because we are that detection business, you know, people are looking at it and going like, oh, my dog didn't do as good on this one as they should to be a detection dog. But like, all, don't you also ask your dog to do agility three times a month, you know, mm -hmm. and in agility, you might really want the dog that is extra collaborative with you. Like I always tell people, you know, I did um, our distracting pointing cue with Gus and we have training that kind of comes into that. So mm -hmm. Gus will fail that, you know, if we were looking at it purely from a detection standpoint, six out of six times, he's going to go where I tell him to. Mm -hmm. And that's valuable information for me as a nose work handler. Um, but it also shows me, you know, kind of where my obedience is at. So if I wasn't doing nose work and I was just doing obedience, I would love that. Right. So we have to kind of look at it with what is our, you know, what is the application we're asking the dog to do. Um, but yeah, it's been interesting to learn more about the cognition and um, really start to see it kind of applied with our dogs and also how people are applying it, you know, once they learn it from us um, with their dogs and kind of the takeaways um, and just the problem solving, just watching the testing and watching the dogs actually kind of come up with their different methods of like, I'm going to try it this way. And you can really see the dog kind of thinking it through as mm -hmm. they go through that testing. So yeah, it's it's been fun. What has been something that you've seen now 
that you've traveled and done cognitive testing on hundreds of dogs in different regions of the United States and different people, different backgrounds, what is something that stands out that you see people take away from after they go through this with you? I would say a big one would be how much influence they have over the dog, you know, and when we're working with detection people, you know, just to be so cognizant of how much they actually are, how much information the dog is really paying attention to them for, um, you know, and we can see it as we go through the tests. And then we, you know, we have our kind of our last inference test where it gets much harder because now there's no information mm -hmm. and kind of the drop off from the dog's performance in some cases with that because of that kind of lack of um, information. So, you know, I think a lot of people are either like, oh, thank God my dog doesn't only listen to me, or they're kind of surprised that, you know, either through training or just that relationship aspect, the dog is really keyed into them and, and how we might need to adjust that um, to be more successful within our detection or more aware of our own potential kind of cueing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's been, you know, I did it for years and then I've passed the torch to you and you've been going around doing a lot of cognition now. But there was one thing that you did that I never did. And it's a segment that people really have been interested in. It's a logistics issue most times, but yeah. puppy cognition. Talk about puppy cognition and what you've learned from that. And we'll get into you, what you've been doing the past few years too, which is raising multiple different puppies and different breeds and training them in detection. But Let's start with puppy cognition. What have you learned and what's the what's a good takeaway that you had from it and that you want to share with others with puppy cognition seminars? Yeah, I mean, the puppy cognition, you know, is uh, kind of our, our tricky one, like you said, with logistics, because we are since we're booking so far in advance, we like everything has to kind of go according to plan in order for one of those to kind of work out. But we had our um, our puppy cognition uh, last year with a handful of puppies that we were raising um, and it was super interesting to watch them work through that test. And then, you know, after doing that with them when they were young puppies and then kind of continuing to raise them and really see those aspects that we saw within that testing um, kind of can either continue to display themselves or, mm -hmm. you know, we were able to kind of look at that, you know, like Cora, for example, with the, uh, you know, the impulsiveness, yeah. um, kind of look at that and, and make adjustments to her training plan and thing like, things like that um, in order to kind of better address where she was or, you know, what kind of dog she is mentally. Um, you know, I'd love to do more of the puppy cognition and, and get to do it. Oh, I think it's really neat. Like I've had a couple of people reach out that have like whole litters. I think that would be fascinating. Um, and you know, we did our puppy testing with Alara and Ranger and, and even a half sibling to them. Um, and that was super interesting. The differences, you know, even just between a litter, Ranger and Alara were pretty similar in their results. Mm -hmm. Um, even though their personalities are, are quite different, their cognitive results mm -hmm. were pretty similar. Um, and then the, the half sibling um, was pretty different even from that. And, and it's interesting to kind of look at that and go, is that, you know, how much of that is genetics versus, you know, kind of what the dog is learning in their household. So that dog is in a, in a very much a, a pet household, you know, whereas we are training ours, you know, more specifically for detection roles. So they're raising, they're getting raised a little bit differently. Um, but yeah, it's been really interesting. And, and the puppy, the cool thing with the puppy testing is um, it's just like a day of laughing because it's so <laughs> funny, the things that they do and you yeah. wouldn't, you wouldn't expect. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's pretty interesting. So what are the things that are important about puppy cognition? How does it help you as a handler or a trainer? Why would you want to do puppy cognition? So the cool thing about puppy cognition that we don't really get with the with our adult cognition is the ability to kind of see um, how that puppy learns and then make adjustments to how we're going to set up their training plan going forward, um, you know, to see some of the different kind of methods that the, that the puppy is using or the different kind of um, initial learning styles of that puppy and say, we would like to tweak it a little bit more in this direction. Because or, this is the only time we can tweak it. There's a certain right. period of time, and we cover this in the puppy cognition, where you have an ability to make adjustments now, potentially. It's not right. guaranteed, but it's the only window that exists. Right. Um, but go on. Yeah. So, you know, I think that that's something really valuable within the puppy cognition that we don't get to kind of explore with the adult dogs is that ability to to make those tweaks in their training plan. And and also, you know, there's just a huge benefit to 
having all that information before we go into all of their, you know, uh, initial nose work or, you know, odor work um, to like kind of already know before we even do, you know, our first session with odor or searching or anything to already know this puppy is extremely high memory or this Mm -hmm. puppy is very visual, Mm -hmm. you know, to have that information, you know, to kind of take with us through their entire training process, you know, as opposed to kind of catching them as an adult or, you know, testing them as we've already started their training to have that information from day one is is really helpful. Yeah, and that's where I look at where many that are interested in it, especially the breeders or programs that have a puppy raising aspect to it, that's where it's really beneficial. Again, the logistics is the hard part. Right. Is uh, We have to have puppies to do a puppy cognition class. And mixing that need or when there's puppies available to when we're we're available available is the other part of that. Um, But you do have – I know you'll be doing one more than likely in Australia in August. Um, I know they've been reaching out to you here and there. And, again, it comes up to availability, puppies and or you. Um, But, yeah, so those that are watching and listening, Natalie is our cognition person, does a lot of it. I still do it from time to time. Um, but what I really love about you getting out there and doing it is, you know, you have that diverse background from pet training to the sport side of things, to the force free side of the world, to like how to communicate this to people to do, you know, what the takeaways are cognitively, how they can be applied to obedience, how they can be applied to the things, you know, I come at it a little bit more, uh, focused in the sense of, I'm using it from the professional world. Um, That's how it started for me was testing it on, you know, the Navy SEAL dogs and police canines and things like that. And what I look for, um, and and obviously the two of us doing it helps spread that further, but, uh, and I'm hoping Sarah Bruski gets into it more now, her and I have talked and that'll help get that going out there further. So that's the cognition spot uh, that I wanted to kind of hit for their listeners and, um, keep that going. We get asked a lot, and I'll let you answer this because they ask me all the time, why haven't we put it online? What's the biggest issue that comes into... So the challenge with cognition from a distance learning factor is um, there's so many nuances with it. So like I was saying, it's, it's not necessarily intuitive. It's, there's a lot of very specific protocols you need to follow. And if one little aspect of that protocol gets missed or or gets um, presented in the wrong way, it can completely change your results. So having somebody there in person to say, whoa, 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 we missed this, yeah. and then either redoing the test or you know, making adjustments or even you know when we do that initial all of our day one, um, when we do our seminars, it's just the handlers practicing because that's so important. So it's kind of scary you know, for us to think about putting it online where people are going to take it and kind of do what they will and you know, God forbid people go away and do the test, not realizing they were making a bunch of mistakes and they come back going, my dog is this, this, and this. You're like, well, maybe not so much, you know, because we don't have that ability. The results were skewed. Right. We don't have that ability to kind of oversee it and make sure that things are being done correctly so that we don't have, you know, potentially skewed results. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's kind of the challenge with, with that. And we've had fun training others to become cognition instructors. Uh, so the, the the network of those that are out there that can do this is growing. We have Georgie in the UK. We have Alex in Australia. Um, we'll have uh, Lauren over in uh, Switzerland coming up. Um, you're actually going there in February and doing a bunch of that. Um, the other one, the big fun one, those that are listening and watching, is we'll be doing a full cognition instructor and cognition class at Michael Ellis's in March. So they can go to the website and check that out. Now, puppy raising. So you have gotten to do puppy raising now for a couple of years, raising dogs to become, in this case, detection dogs. What has been one of the experiences or takeaways that you've had Raising a puppy to go now, go do a job. Um, I miss them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I, I can attest. She <laughs> definitely loves her her loves herself some Frank and loves herself some little well, quill. Yeah, you didn't even bring your quill them. mug. Here. I know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been awesome. You know, I think it really shows. I've, I, I'm not sure exactly how many puppies I've raised, but it's a, more than a handful. Yeah, you're at eight or so, I believe. Um, but so, 
you know, the genetics is the biggest thing. So you can see the genetics, you know, kind of the ability of the dog come through really early on. And I definitely think to a degree they kind of have what we need as far as working ability or they don't. But we can do a lot, obviously, to build what they have to make it as as good as possible so that when they go off to their handler, you know, they are we have, you know, kind of sent them away with, you know, a 100 percent kind of chance to display their best self and to really um, be a great handler or be a great team member, you know, with their handler. Um, it's super fun doing the puppy raising. It's a lot of work. You know, I've cleaned up more, um, poop in this last uh, two years than I probably will the whole rest of my life, unless we keep doing puppies Puppies at this rate, but I don't think so. Um, but yeah, it's been super rewarding. I mean, watching them go with their handlers. So let's take it to, okay, let's go to, you go to a breeder. What are you looking for? When you're kind of observing the puppies that did Josh breed them? No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, or or uh, Mr. Kraus. You know, yeah. so with with um, the young puppies, especially for us, if we're looking at spaniels, you can only see so much when they're six or eight weeks old. Like they only are gonna. I call them little hamsters at that age. Yep. They're you know they're little potatoes. They're only gonna show you so much. So I definitely look at the parents and you know what the parents look like as far as um, the work that they're That's doing. That's a big one. Yeah. And then we do still do some of our, you know, environmental and, um, you know, I do like a flirt pull or a rag or whatever to see who is going to kind of show the most interest in that. I want to see at least kind of a twinge of like, ooh, that's something I want to get. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I look at that and we do some different surfaces to see how they handle being put on a strange surface, you know, things like that. And then um, kind of along with you know, having a trusted breeder that you can really talk to about the lines and has a good kind of understanding of of what his lines are and and all the background Mm -hmm. with that. And even with, you know, some of the puppies that we haven't been able to select in person, um, you know, being able to talk to the breeder kind of in depth and um, get that background on what the parents do and, and all that kind of information um, has, yeah, it's been really, um, awesome. And we've got to work with some really great breeders, you know, mm-hmm. over the years, um, that have just given us some fantastic, you know, it's awesome to hear back from the handler and, you know, how great the dogs are doing and how much the handler loves them, because obviously we do get attached, you know, to a degree, mm-hmm. like I'm more than happy to, you know, let them go off with the handler, but it's awesome to be able to see that all the work, you know, that you put into the puppy really mm-hmm. pays off. And now they have this great career um, with their professional handler. So. so when you, so you've selected it from the breeder, now you've taken it, you're, you're starting the, the raising process. What are the things that you're doing in that first, let's say eight weeks to 12 weeks? So the first month, what are you really focusing on? What are you trying to develop? What are you What are you working on in general? So, you know, that, that first period with the puppies, you know, is obviously initially I'm going to kind of let them just have some acclimation time. And I want them to be puppies and you know, all of the things that kind of go into any good puppy raising for whatever, you know, venue you're looking at is going to be the same for detection. So I want to be able to have good socialization and make sure they're comfortable going into different environments, you know, not necessarily just things to do with detection, but things that are going to produce a well-rounded dog that is confident, you know, in their life. Mm -hmm. Um, So a lot of that early stuff is just environmental exposure, um, you know, different sounds, different sights. Uh, We do a lot of toy development early on. Um, to really kind of harness, you know, the drives that they do already have naturally. I like to try to do a little bit of um, retrieve stuff so they, you know, maybe have a retrieve to hand later on or a good, just good cooperative play type skills. Um, And then, you know, normal puppy stuff. We got to potty train them. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to crate train them. They they are crated a lot, so they need to know really how how to settle in a crate um and how to function in these different strange environments Mm -hmm. um they get they love their car crate they get very comfortable with that obviously when we're training and working all of these other older dogs you know we get a lot of awesome exposure to all sorts of different environments so they get a lot of different environmental exposure because we're also working you know our adult dogs alongside them um so you know a lot of that initial stuff is just good puppy racing socialization so how important is odor do, don't, don't you want to just start putting, teaching them the odor as soon as, like, they can start sniffing? <laughs> um, you know, odor is, a, is an aspect. 
but there's not really a an urgency to start them on odor at that young age. We kind of have more mm -hmm. important, we have bigger fish to fry at those early stages where we really want to make sure the puppy is um, developing as far as their environmental exposure and, and all of those aspects. What's first. the risk that you face if you started doing odor early on? Um, you know, I, th I think some of that is really puppy dependent. Um, obviously, as we start going through different fear periods or, or potentially kind of seeing some of that stuff, we want to maybe want to have a bad um, exposure, you know, with that odor kind of gets lumped in with. Um, but I think a lot of that is kind of puppy dependent. I, I think in some cases, you, you know, you could definitely start them on odor at a younger age, but there's not necessarily a huge advantage of that. Um, you know, because there's all of these other aspects you want to work on. Another one, you know, is the cooperative care aspect. I want to be mm -hmm. able to do their nails. I want to be able to, you know, clean their ears and have them feel happy and comfortable with that from that young age. Um, odor is just not at the top of that list. We have a lot of other stuff to kind of do first. And then, you know, we have our whole step zero, which is all of our kind of hunt development that mm -hmm. we do with toy or food. So, you know, so we have that whole stage that we want to really see the dog is strong with before we go ahead and add odor. Um, so, you know, yeah, the odor is just not at the top of that list as mm -hmm. far as kind of priorities with a young, a young puppy like that. So when you hit that four month to six, seven month old range, so now they're starting to do stuff. Um, kind of like you said, you're, you're definitely still doing a lot of the developmental skills uh, is this a stage where you start pulling in the odor work? I think it would depend on kind of where they were with our step zero stuff. Um, you know, like Alara and Ranger are nine. They might be closer to 10 months now. Yeah. Um, but they've been on odor for about two months. So, you know, we start thinking about getting them on odor at, you know, closer to five, five and a half, six months. Again, kind of depending on the dog. Um you know, and then and then starting, you know, starting all of that work again as, you know, kind of its own thing while we are still continuing to build, you know, these other skills that the dog needs. You know, that environmental exposure and the dog's confidence in new environments is really mm -hmm. the number the number one concern that I have because if you if you have a dog that's not environmentally comfortable, regardless of how well it is at working odor or, you know, working a source, if they can't work in strange environments as a professional detection dog, they're not going to cut it. Yeah. You know, so that's really number one. Yeah. Well, that's the number one reason why almost all dogs get washed out is the environmental aspect. The yeah. en environmental issues is what washes out the dogs. It's not their ability to detect an odor or to indicate to the odor right. or things like that. It's the fact that they get nervy or overexcited or any number of things that are environmental related is where the washout occurs, which is why, you know, as we do puppy raising – the environmental aspect is the important part that we spend a lot of time in those eight weeks to eight months is kind of the, where I've kind of put it. Uh, we're doing a lot of that. Like you said, step zero development, searching, environmental, communication skills, you know, husbandry, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot to do. Yeah. Um, and so if you have limited training time, I'm not going to take away from those other those other things, yeah. you know, in order to, to do some odor work when I, I can easily do that. Yeah. at a later stage. And, and there's so the excitement I think that people get into is I wanted to I want to I want them on something and I want them to smell something, I want them to find something. And that ends up missing critical other things that are that have to be solid uh because if those things aren't there all that knowing odor is worthless. So right. the last part I'll hit on the puppies is you've got to do multiple breeds. So what's your takeaway on working with the breeds? Um, how did you find yourself into these breeds that you really like now? And, you know, share some of that experience. So, you know, I've only raised two lab puppies, so I would say I haven't had enough to really have a full understanding of, you know, the, the whole raising of, of lab puppies. At this point, I've raised enough spaniels that I think I can kind of say, you know, I, I understand how, how, they, how it works to raise a spaniel puppy. They're definitely a lot easier than, you know, the labs. I think any of the kind of larger dogs anyways are just, they're much slower maturing and they're just a little bit needier um, at the younger ages anyways. And then they kind of settle into, okay, this is my routine and this mm -hmm. is what we do. 
whereas the spaniels are pretty quick to kind of adapt to that stuff relatively early on. Um, and then because they mature a little bit faster, you know, for us raising and training dogs that are going to go to potentially green handlers or, you know, and we don't have all the time in the world. So, you know, having kind of our spaniels that do tend to mature a little bit faster and, you know, by the time they're, you know, 10, 12 months, we have a pretty good idea of like, this is who the dog is. Whereas our labs at 10 or 12 months are really still developing quite a bit and still maybe very much kind of puppyish. Whereas like even, I mean, Alara and Ranger, like they're dogs. Yeah. You know, they're not really... Kind of. Ranger still... Yeah, he, I guess yeah. he is a little <laughs> bit more immature because yeah. uh, he's the boy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so that, I think that faster kind of maturation period with the smaller, maybe just because they're a little bit smaller, you just kind of know, you know, kind of where they're going to be at developmental wise as they continue to kind of go into adolescence. Um, but, you know, the spaniels are obvious. I never thought that I would own a cocker spaniel. If you told me that, you know, a number of years ago, I would have been like, I, I want a mouth. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> I still want a mouth, but yeah. just not at this point in time. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the spaniels are awesome. Banner was my first spaniel, Springer spaniel. And um, he actually ended up, we washed him for mm -hmm. environmental um, factors. Um, his no, you know, his odor work was great mm -hmm. and, and still maybe is. But uh, my mom actually owns him now. So I still get to see him quite mm -hmm. a bit. And, um, you know, the spaniels are very different from kind of what I was used to as far as I always had pretty much herding breeds. And the spaniels are quite different from that. Um, you know, the biggest kind of thing I feel like I learned with them and raising them, um, you know, taking them through detection is um, that intrinsic motivation and how different that is. So the herding breeds, you know, like Gus doesn't care that much about working environment. He's mm -hmm. trying to do what I think, you know, he's looking mm -hmm. at me going, what do you want me to do? And he wants the thing. And he wants the thing. Yeah. Very singularly toy, focused. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas our spaniels have all of that awesome hunt drive. So like I kind of think of it as like Gus's hunt that I've created is kind of manufactured. So he doesn't necessarily have a genetic kind of base of hunting in that way. You know, mm -hmm. he's made for herding. Whereas our spaniels have all that hunt. They have all that hunt. We get it for free and it's, it's natural. But because we have that intrinsic motivation for the hunting, um, those early steps in our detection process, you know, really need to be thought out well because that hunting can override, you know, them wanting to just do the boring the, odor work, yeah, you know, very early on. Yeah, focus on the one thing we want to find, not Correct. just search the entire environment. So that's probably been the biggest kind of difference with them um, as far as, like, learning how to kind of work them and bring them out. What about, know? like, the possession and toy, play, all those things? What um share what some of the differences are that you have seen between dealing with the spaniels versus labs versus the other herding breeds um yeah you know our, our spaniels are are made to have a, a softer mouth and they're you know bred a lot of times with kind of that that retrieve not necessarily the same possession that we'll necessarily see you know maybe see out of our labs or our shepherds you know where they just want to hold on to the thing and and possess it um, you know, and I think it's interesting with the Spaniels because we have purposely developed some of that. Um, and, and it does work to a point. They do develop much more possessiveness mm -hmm, than mm -hmm. they would, you know, with somebody that was using them for hunting. Like Josh, you know, will say he's horrified when we show yeah. those tugging videos because like they shouldn't do that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, you definitely, we can cultivate a degree of that, but their, their toy focus is not necessarily to the same degree that their focus on the hunt is. And well, I, I shared a question with you the other day that I saw on a discussion group where a handler who had a spaniel was frustrated because he had finished school and he's had a spaniel on his own now. The spaniel goes to the first odor, then takes off and goes searching for other odors. And it, it, he was starting to lose the indication because the dog would just go, okay, there's odor one, and then take off and go search for more odors. Um, the industry on the professional side is very used to strong possession. I want this thing um, where like you bringing up, whether it be the pointers or the spaniels or these others that are sporting breeds designed for lots of searching, get their 
satisfaction and drive motivation satisfaction out of the hunting. And that looks very different because they will go to an odor. They'll do the thing that you want to, but talk a bit about the importance of training that and get them to understand that versus, like you said, that intrinsic rewarding satisfaction that comes from, I just want to hunt. Yeah. So, you know, I think a lot of people's initial kind of thought process when their dog, you know, they see it kind of work to odor and then it takes off. They kind of want to, they wait it out. And I think with our Spaniels, we can't do that. So with some of our other breeds, there's not that intrinsic motivation necessarily to just work the environment. But with our Spaniels, if we let that become rehearsed and that's, okay, I can, I'll let you know when I'm ready to tell you about it. I'm going to work this whole space first. You know, when we set up that sequence of events of the dog comes in, maybe they work odor right away and then they just aren't going to do that communication aspect because they're not done working the environment you know, we have to really early on to set it up where the dog understands this comes first. Mm -hmm. And then that is what gives me access to go work the environment the way I want, you know, or, or just kind of get some free time to be a spaniel. Um, you know, so we do a lot of our, our initial training is maybe very controlled. And then the odor work is what gives the dog access then to kind of the rest of the environment. Um, so we keep that sequence the way that we need it operationally later where the dog is going to come in, work odor, communicate they found odor, and then start our reward sequence, which in a lot of cases with our spaniels may include getting released back to the environment um, as part of their, their training. So they really understand that telling us about odor is something beneficial for them and not something that we're kind of creating a conflict with them about, you know, because the, the worst thing you can introduce with your detection dog is that you and the dog are now having a conflict about something that re should really be something you, you know, work with together, something that helps you be collaborative as opposed to, you know, something you're fighting with them on, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as far as not having that communication, you know, and, and when people make those points, like my dog drops a toy and goes back to hunting. Yeah. Uh, that's a nice problem that's to have, problem. you know, uh, and obviously with that, if you're losing the communication, that's an issue, you know, but we had like little Onyx. I mean, that's probably one of the strongest dogs I feel like I've seen come through us. Uh, that dog is a rock star detection dog. Um, but I'll say, you know, he's a lot of dog and he's very <laughs> quick, you know, what was now he, you know like why I picked him. 10 pounds or something? Like he was yeah. small. Um, but that was a lot of dog and, and challenging, you know, for some of that initial training because he was so quick. But to watch him mature and really come into his own because he has that hunt drive, that dog, I mean, talk about it. That dog will go all day. Yeah. If you build up his physical endurance, that dog will do the game all day, yeah. toy or no toy probably. Yeah. yeah. You know, so. Um, I think you learned a lot with ammo, too. Well, ammo was probably really the kind of the first, you know, Quill was an angel, so he just didn't give me any <laughs> trouble at all. Quill was like my little border collie cocker. Like he was like, whatever you want, mom. Yeah. And then ammo is much more independent, much more has his own opinions about things. Um, so with ammo, we really saw like he, you know, we he had a ton of hunt drive. You could see all the hunt drive and you'd be like, well, he just doesn't want to do the thing. You know, he doesn't want to do the, the baby stuff. He just wants to go work the environment. So you could see where he's going to be an awesome detection dog when we teach him what the thing is yeah. that we want him to go find because we had that hunt. But getting to that stage where we could say, this is the thing, you got to go find it out here yeah. and tell me about it, you know, was a challenge. And that's where we really started to learn with those types of dogs, that aspect of controlling the environment early on and, and kind of creating that sequence where the odor was the thing that gave them access to the mm -hmm. other stuff um, was huge. And you could see when, when he got that, when that clicked for him that, oh, it's this and then that, okay, mm -hmm. got it. Mm -hmm. You know, and then like as you've worked with him now yeah. as you, you know, as he's progressed that now we have all that benefit of the hunt drive without the conflict. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So in total now, you've been doing all this for 12 years or so, like, from training to... I, I had my first training job. You know, I got CODA when I was 15, so I started all the trick training and all that stuff mm -hmm. at 15. Um, but I had my first training job at 18, so... Yeah, yeah, you've been... So you're not a baby trainer, as some people... Because people may not know who you are at first, and, you know, I got young. my first 
a um, pair of Crocs for my birthday, so I'm officially <laughs> a veteran trainer, yes. I'd say. Yeah, her birthday was just a few days ago, and she's one of those people that are lucky enough to have birthday and Christmas mixed together. Yeah. So, yeah, lo- loads of fun there. Um, well, thank you for taking you know the opportunity to talk to me. I know these kind of things are <laughs> always your comfortable thing, but yet you are the face of our online stuff. You, you know, many times when people are reaching out, um, for a lot of one-on-ones now are going to you, whether it be online. Um, so those that are been watching and listening, I hope you guys get to see more of Natalie through by attending some of our seminars. You're getting to work with, uh, some of the best now out there with coming up with Michael Ellis school. We're going to be doing classes out there and you'll be doing some stuff with him. I know tease a little bit of what's coming up with you know the projects that you're going to get to do with Michael that you're super excited about. Yeah, you know, the so I love obedience. You know, a lot of people, that competition obedience, it's so stiff. I love that. I love the structure behind it. I love how pretty it looks. Um, so that's always been a huge interest of mine. And But on the, de- you know, in the detection world, we don't really do a ton with obedience. And part of that is because it pulls that, that handler focus. Um, but Michael is working on putting together in an obedience specifically for detection that has less of that handler focus aspect and more focus on a lot of remote rewards or reward away from the handler and kind of sending the dog. So you have that nice obedience, but not necessarily the fancy handler focus stuff that, you know, we're used to seeing with our, you know, competitive obedience. So I'm super excited to learn that and start doing that with Alara and Ranger and kind of have them be our first, you know, um, detection obedience dogs that, Mm -hmm. you know, have this kind of different style of obedience um, that lends itself a little bit better to how, you know, how um, independent we need them to be in their detection work. So, yeah, I'm I'm really excited to to see some of that stuff. And you've been actually doing some of the stuff with Pat Nolan, too. You've been taking some of the directional uh, information that he has. Just kind of dipping my toes into some of that. But, you know, it's, it's always interesting to just kind of keep learning more and I'm excited to further kind of do some of that stuff with mm-hmm. Alara and, you know, really take advantage of her, her that independence streak that she has and turn it into some, you know, some really cool yeah. directional stuff. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff coming up in 2023. Um, again, for those that are watching and listening, um, Natalie's contact information, it's pretty simple. It's just Natalie at FordK9.com is her email address. On social media, you're at natalieknowsk9.com, and it's N-O-S-E versus mm-hmm. K-N-O-W-S. But uh, you can find her on Instagram. That's probably where you post the most. You do a little bit of Facebook, but you're that millennial generation that I likes Instagram I post on Instagram, Instagram and then it goes to, to Facebook. Facebook. There you yeah. go. There you go. So, um, well, thank everybody for, you know, tuning in and listening to us or watching us. If you're not on our YouTube channel, go find Ford Canine on YouTube. These podcasts along with the Q&As, we've got a Q&A coming up uh, that we'll do. And we also do your informational videos that you share with training along with me. Um, and as usual, people keep checking out the website. You'll get to see more and more of Natalie at or basically around the world now. You're going to be Canada, Switzerland, Australia, all kinds of places. Yep. So I've just thrown you into the deep end all the way. (laughs) So again, thank you everybody for tuning in. Thank you guys. And listening to Canine's Talking Sense, where it's okay to be nosy.